Hey guys, I'm Philip Molina, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 9, Battle of the Freaking Bastards. And holy crap, I told you it was going to be insane, did I not? This was one of the biggest productions Game of Thrones has ever done, like ever. Probably is the biggest, actually. So I'm, I'm gonna break this down for you and point out all kinds of stuff that made this one of the best, most emotionally destructive Game of Thrones episodes we've ever had. Also, heads up, we're gonna have a quick word from our sponsor in the, later in the video, uh, but it's not gonna be too long and it's not who you think it is, uh, but we'll get to that. For now, let's get started with the opening images. So these shots of these fireballs being loaded into catapults and going through a pretty elaborate process before they can fly into marine, they're visually impressive, sure, but they actually don't fulfill their meaning until you realize that we weren't the only ones watching that elaborate process. We actually were witnessing Danny's perspective on this attack and these fireballs. And take note of her expression. Has she ever been calmer? Another way to put it is, uh, uh, she's unimpressed. When you're the mother of dragons and they can do this, it becomes funny how hard these little guys have to work to produce a fraction of the effect. It's like watching somebody make coffee by growing the beans and grinding them and putting them in a coffee maker. When you're like, uh, wouldn't it be a lot easier to just take meth? I know I should have said something like, oh, use a Keurig, but I just wanted to be clear, that's how much more intense it is to have dragons. Three dragons. It's coffee beans to meth. Now, quick history lesson, even the Romans actually had something cooler than these fireballs. They invented something called Greek fire, or sometimes called liquid fire, and technically, we still don't even know how they made it, like what it was comprised of. It was terrifying to use in naval battles because it could not be put out by water. You had to use sand to suffocate the flames. So they filled up pots with this stuff and launched it at invading armadas. If this all sounds kind of familiar, that's because Greek fire is the basis for wildfire, and the Battle of the Blackwater, that was actually based on the second Arab siege of Constantinople. Funny also, just like Tyrion did uh, in that battle, they also used a great chain uh, as a form of defense. And speaking of wildfire, we get this moment with Tyrion reminding Daenerys and us that the Mad King- He had caches of wildfire hidden under the Red Keep. The guild halls, the Scepter Baylor, all the major thoroughfares. Now, if you've been watching our breakdowns, you know that this sounds like the uh, theory time we've gone into more than once about what might happen at the end of this season with Cersei and that same fire. Go back and check out one of those videos if you want to know more, but the only thing I'll add here, aside from the damn it sure sounds like that's gonna happen, is that if you listen very, very closely and note the moment the camera cuts away from Tyrion, it sounds like part of his line was 80 yard, which means recorded after they shot this scene and then added in later. Well, he told my brother and Jamie told me he had caches of wildfire hidden under the Red Keep. So maybe the original script didn't mention that the wildfire was hidden underneath the Red Keep itself, which is the place all of the royals live, and they had to go back and put that line in to make sure that Tyrion could set that up for some reason. Hmm. Or maybe not, but we will find out soon enough. Also, this little speech that Tyrion is giving here, it introduces us to the themes of this episode, about how conquerors and masters alike, they use different methods to inspire loyalty or fealty, and used incorrectly, the subjects will turn against that loyalty burned every one of his citizens, the loyal ones and the traitors. We'll talk about how that applies to the bastards later. But I will quickly point out, a lot of these guys down there are also just slaves that aren't really loyal, they're just doing what they gotta do. This whole scene, by the way, it introduces a possibility that we've never really talked about on our channel, but is worth discussing. Daenerys has the instincts of a Targaryen. She wants to savagely destroy multiple cities and kill everyone there. She definitely sounds like a conqueror and also a little bit crazy. And let's remember, crazy is definitely in her blood. So sure, Tyrion being there might make all the difference, but what if it doesn't? Could Daenerys Targaryen morph into becoming a great villain on this show? Like, I know it sounds crazy, but let's remember that she's about to bring a huge horde of rapists and pillagers to Westeros, and yet she doesn't seem too worried about it. It's just something to keep a lookout for. And speaking of keeping a lookout, did you notice how the show reused that trick from episode three, where it looks like Danny is making eye contact with the person that is talking down to her, but once more, she's actually looking past them toward the source of her power? Her eyes keep telling the true story of what's about to happen. Now going outside the pyramid, we see that at the entrance of the city, the Sons of the Harpy are coordinating an attack at this same moment, which means that Tyrion was right and the Slave Masters were lying. They were, in fact, behind the Sons of Harpy. But also, this might shut down a storyline from the books. In the books, there's a big deal about who the leader of the Sons of the Harpy is. It's implied to be someone we already know and it's a really big betrayal, but it feels like the show has decided to maybe eliminate this plotline entirely and just make the Slave Masters the leaders of the Sons. I sure hope it's not the case though, because I 
I love these like double crossy twist moments. Like it could be anyone, but it's probably no one. No, uh, not no, no one, unless, no, it's, it's definitely not. <laughs> By the way, there are a lot of parallels between the two battles of this episode, and I'll point out a few later, but a pretty obvious one is that Danny and John are both pretty lucky to have these surprise cavalries at their backs. Now, I know we want to move on to talking about the other epic battle, but because that battle is so big and so much of the episode, I'm going to have a big love letter for that later. I think we should just really quick wrap up our points about Marine, and then we can move on. Let's note that Daenerys still has her babies trained really well, with the word Dracarys once more wiping out some enemies, this being the third time. Dracarys. And according to the books, dragons are very monogamous creatures, so the fact that she has this sort of psychic link with all three of hers means that Danny definitely is more than just tight with her dragons. You can tell it's a very focused link, actually, because the dragons don't go on some rampage here. They specifically focus all their flames on only one ship. It's smart, because if you look closely, you can see all these men on the other ships abandoning them, making it so that Danny can very easily adopt this entire navy as her own, with only one ship having received any damage. Other side note, it's really fun to switch out the sound whenever you see the dragons breathing fire to the sound of dragons puking their guts out. <laughs> Okay, then Grey Worm touches on our loyalty theme again when he asks the troops, why fight for men who would never fight for you? This is another parallel to the battle to come. And the way that Grey Worm decides which of these masters to execute is actually a little bit of a reference to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That movie takes a biblical theme of repentance being necessary for salvation, so begging forgiveness for all your sins so you can get into heaven, and it turns it into this phrase. The penitent man will pass. And just like in that movie, when the penitent man kneels down for forgiveness, He's saved. Also in that scene, this was really easy to miss, Tyrion looks away for the entirety of the execution, and at first I thought it was because he was being squeamish, but then I remembered that Tyrion has seen plenty of people die, and more than one at his own hands, so then I realized this is actually a bit of a power move. This means he's taken away the opportunity for them to even negotiate with him any further. This means it's now on them to determine which of them should die, and he knows if they have to argue amongst themselves, the dishonorable ones will be known pretty quickly. He should die. Yes, him. He's not one of us. He's an outsider, lowborn. He does not speak for us. Now let's just knock out this scene with Theon and Yara arriving in Marine, and we'll be done with this storyline for the episode. We learned a lot about how surprisingly skilled Yara is with these sort of negotiations, and it's amazing to see just how equal Danny comes to see Yara. Has the Iron Islands ever had a queen before? No more than Westeros. Danny forces people to bow to her, so it's very significant that here the scene ends with a handshake and the two of them standing on level ground. That's a first for Danny, and it's fitting that it comes with her first conversation with another powerful leading woman. This union, by the way, is also reminiscent of the one John had in preparation for his battle with the same kind of handshake, but it also is in contrast to the allegiance that's going to be forced upon him at the end of the episode. That definitely is not coming on equal ground. That'll be important, but we'll explain why when we get to it. Lastly, I'm going to point out that we've already said how Danny is becoming a lot like Aegon Targaryen, aka Aegon the Conqueror, who was famous for riding his dragon into battle, but what we haven't really talked about is how he did so in a group of three dragons. Except he didn't ride alone. His sister wives rode the other dragons alongside him. So could this be where this relationship is headed? And if Yara does become some sort of sister wife to Danny, and if she does get her own dragon, does that mean she can be trusted? It is worth noting that when Danny bans the Ironborn from any more reaving and raping, Yara barely puts up a fight. That's our way of life. No more. No more. But just a few episodes ago, Theon used only three words to describe Yara. She is a reaver. She is a warrior. She is ironborn. If reaving, which means plundering like a Viking or a Dothraki, if reaving is really that high on her list, then can we really believe that she'd let it go that easily? Or is she just telling Danny what she wants to hear? All right, and as we transition over to Westeros, I'm just gonna point out that earlier this season, Game of Thrones had Jon Snow be resurrected the same day Orthodox Christians were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was Easter. And when this episode aired, it was all about bastard sons and a room full of people bad-mouthing their fathers. Our fathers were evil men, all of us here. And it was on Father's Day. So if we extend that thinking, uh, I wonder if anything bad is gonna happen this upcoming Sunday holiday, which is, oh, Kids Day. Oh, sorry, buddy. 
Okay, okay, moving on to the battle in the north. We start with this parley between the bastards, and it's interesting to hear this skewed worldview that Ramsay has. Like, he doesn't know he's the villain. He keeps calling John a bastard. Even though so is Ramsay, he refers to Sansa as his beloved wife and Lady Bolton. And he even seems to call Lady Mormont a treasonous lords. When really, hers is one of the only houses that refuses to break their oath to House Stark. It's like the opposite of treason. Uh, I love this stare down, by the way, that she gives him, which is made even better when you find out that this little actress, Bella Ramsey, she'd never acted before this part. She's just that scary of a child. But back to the point about being bastards. Obviously, it's significant as it's the title of the episode, but it's also part of this grander theme of loyalty. Aside from in Dorn, being a bastard in Westeros is kind of like the ultimate test of loyalty. You're expected to do everything this family tells you, and if it comes to it, you're supposed to fight and possibly die for them. I may be a bastard but he is my father and Rob is my brother. <laughs> but despite being of their blood, you have no rights to their lands, you're not the heir to their titles, you don't get their last name, you're not even supposed to fly their banners. A bastard boy with nothing to inherit. It makes the whole concept of a battle of bastards pretty ironic because if they were technically bastards, they wouldn't even have anything to offer the other one if they lose. I know that it's more complicated in this situation, but it still illustrates this idea pretty well. Bastards don't get most of the benefits, yet they're supposed to be totally loyal to their houses. We're gonna finish up this thought a little later, but suffice it to say that Ramsay and John take very different paths in their loyalty to their houses. I belong with my brother. Where are you, bro? now and the loyalty that they've earned from those that fight for them or haven't earned oh i will point out though before we move on that neither of these bastard born men follow the rule of not flying the banners of their houses according to westerosi tradition they're supposed to fly banners where the two main colors of the house sigil have been swapped now we can probably give ramsay a pass because roost did legitimize him before he died but john technically shouldn't be flying these though one maybe he's using santa's right to fly them and two what was he supposed to do have everyone stop what they're doing and so new banners. So no, while I don't care that John is kind of breaking some rules here, I do think that the banner that he's supposed to be flying though, the one with the swapped colors, is really interesting. Because the Stark banner is known for portraying a gray direwolf on a white field of snow, but if you were to swap the colors properly, the white field of snow would become a gray backdrop and that direwolf, it would become white, just like Ghost. No word if it would need to have red eyes though. Speaking of direwolves, when Lord Umber tosses Shaggy Dog's head onto the battlefield, there's a small chance that this was being foreshadowed way back in season one. Rickon is hiding in the Stark crypts with Shaggy Dog and he very specifically states, He doesn't like change. Now, first, I'm gonna remind you, in the entirety of this TV show, Rickon Stark has had less than like 10 lines and in all of those lines, other than when he's directly quoting someone else, the only time he ever mentions an object, it's those chains and how Shaggy Dog doesn't like them. And who killed Shaggy Dog? The Umbers. And what's their house sigil? Chains. And considering the Umbers are responsible for Rickon's death too, breaking their Stark loyalty and taking him hostage, it's a bit fitting that immediately after Rickon says that line, he and Shaggy descend back into the darkness of the crypts together, though Chains betrayed them both. Moving on, it's here that Sansa does her badass storm off, and it's also right after this that Ramsay mentions that he hasn't fed his dogs in seven days. My dogs are desperate to meet you. I haven't fed them for seven days. They're ravenous. So many of you were rightly confused about how Sansa could know about this when she quotes it later. You haven't fed them in seven days, you said it yourself. But I think it's okay to imagine that Sansa just heard that detail from someone else in her camp. That scene with Sansa and Ramsay wasn't until the next night. So in those 24 or more hours, I could easily imagine that their men who were scared of Ramsay's numbers were telling scary stories about what they'd heard. Kind of like how you can't help but think about the worst possible things right before you get on a plane. They're just sharing these horrifying details. Uh, it also could be why Ramsay looks a little shocked when she says that. Like, oh, huh, did not know you were aware of that. Okay, now uh, moving on. We do have this strategy meeting scene, but I want to get into that when we're talking about the actual battle. So I'll get back to how strategies worked out uh, uh, later. But before we move forward, I think it's important to point out that with Sansa's history, she's actually right about this. No one can protect me. I don't think that's a reference to Arya, by the way. I know it kind of sounds that way. I think it's just the fact that every person whose job it's been to protect her has failed at that duty. Her dad, her fiance, her first husband, uh, the Hound, Littlefinger, 
Theon, her second husband. If anything, it's hard to find a single relationship for Sansa that has ever been even a positive one. Maybe Brienne? I mean, we'll see. So I do get where she's coming from. We'll come back to this Davos and Tormund scene a little later, so let's just skip to Jon talking to Melisandre. Two quick things to point out here. One, Jon keeps staring into the fire, and I think that's because he knows there's at least some truth to this Lord of Light guy. He's living proof, and he's wondering, or maybe even hoping, that it might be possible to get a glimpse of the battle in the flames. He wants to know how it turns out. And two, Melisandre is straight up lying to Jon in this scene. Like, she's all meek and shy, and I know she started out this season super sad and wimpy, but we know she thinks that because she brought Jon back, he must be the prince that was promised. She said it a few episodes ago. He's the prince that was promised. But she also knows that she gave Stannis way too much false confidence by way of describing him like a badass constantly and telling him about her visions. That cockiness was part of his downfall. So that's why when Jon asks her advice, all she says is, Don't lose instead of filling John in on all of her visions. Basically, she just doesn't want to jinx him. Oh, and those visions, this is pretty cool. They're all coming true. I've mentioned this before, but in the books, there's a moment where Melisandre's confused. She's searching her visions for Stannis by asking the Lord of Light, show me the prince that was promised, Azor Ahai. And she thinks something's wrong because instead of Stannis, all she keeps seeing is snow. Now that's pretty obvious that's a reference to Jon Snow. But the newer visions she's had, well, in the first episode of this season, she's confused again because Jon Snow's dead. And she says in her visions, I saw him in the flames fighting at Winterfell. Well, that's now come true. And last season she said, I have seen myself walk along the battlements of Winterfell. I have seen the flayed man banners lowered to the ground. That's also come true now. So on the outside, she's lying, but deep down, she knows it's all going according to plan. And you know she's got her mojo back because she's also got her inner heat back. That is not a warm outfit she's wearing. Of course, we'll have to see how long these good times last for her because now it seems that Davos has figured out what happened to Shireen. And there are a few things to point out with this realization. First, this is a gorgeous shot, like seriously beautiful. Note how the sunlight is perfectly framed to recreate the fire that Davos Davos is realizing happened. That's masterful. And also, it's the first reference of many to the director's inspiration for the cinematography of the upcoming battle scene, Akira Kurosawa's Ron. We'll bring that inspiration up again shortly. Also, the shot at the end of this scene parallels the shot at the end of the scene right before this one, when Melisandre was left in her tent. The two are both cast in shadow, lit from behind by a fiery orange glow. And both these people have just had basically the same realization. Whatever god would kill people for seemingly no good reason, he's a pretty crappy god. What kind of god would do something like that? The one we've got. And then finally, this scene perfectly sets up what's about to happen because we've just been reminded of what Stannis did when he had to choose between the life of a child from his family and his own success in battle. And now Jon is gonna face the same dilemma. And call it stupid if you want, but the fact that his battle plans go out the window when Rickon is in danger, that only further shows the loyalty that this bastard has for his quasi family. It even outweighs that of the supposedly noble father and his highborn daughter. Now, before we get into this bloodbath part of the battle, let's not just skip over the fact that Rickon has died. First off, Ramsay's sadistic game and skill with the bow and arrow, they're actually foreshadowed way back in the very first time we ever saw Ramsay. You little bastard. And I know you probably thought Rickon should have zigzagged, uh, even the actor did too, actually. But the poor kid had no idea what he was doing. And if you've seen Apocalypto, it turns out zigzagging doesn't always help. And throughout the rest of the episode, we're gonna keep calling out some amazing choices that the director made to keep increasing the tension until we were literally feeling the stress of these moments ourselves. Here's one brilliant choice. Rickon runs and Ramsay pulls back the arrows and we cut away waiting for that release and he keeps dragging it out. And he does this once and then again, and then we've got the big dramatic one, the rule of threes, and that one misses too. Looking at Ramsey's face and knowing that he's a very skilled archer, he's definitely missing on purpose. He's drawing it out as long as possible. And then suddenly without any build of pretension, boom, an arrow just shoots through Rickon's chest. The director sets us up with expectations, gives us a pattern to recognize, and then he suddenly changes all of it to hit us with as much surprise as hits Rickon. And then Rickon is dead and three theories are completed. Two I've told you about before. We've talked about how the name of his diary Wolf, Shaggy Dog refers to a story where it seems like a character is going to have some big important story and instead he just kind of suddenly dies without having really accomplished much. I've also told you about how the Waif's training of Arya seemed to match up with violent attacks on people that Arya cares about and Rickon was included in that montage. Rob, <laughs> <Brad>. <laughs> 
Do break on. But here's a new one I haven't mentioned before. In the very first episode of Game of Thrones, Robert Baratheon arrives in Winterfell and he touches specific members of the Stark family. Eddard, Callan, Rickon, and Rob. Now with Rickon dead, each of those Starks has died and you could say the curse of Robert's touch is complete. Now if you're wondering why Robert would have anything to do with the death of those Starks, let's remember what else happens in that pilot episode. The Starks find a litter of dire wolves whose mothers just died. The dire wolf is the sigil of House Stark and what killed this dire wolf? A stag, the sigil of House Baratheon. It's long been predicted and now it seems pretty true that the Baratheons would bring about the downfall of House Stark. Side note, that same scene with Robert where he touches the now deceased characters, check out what he asks Arya. Your name is? She can't get away from that question and they've been setting it up since the beginning. Uh, oh, and speaking of no one, that's who our sponsor is. No one. There's no sponsor. Instead of that, I actually have a short announcement to make. Hopefully you've been enjoying these breakdowns. They are very fun to make, and I feel like we've built this badass community here of people who really seem to care as much about nerdy stuff as we do. That's why we so badly want to grow this channel into some epic nerd sanctuary where we can explore way more nerd properties at any given time. And to make this legit, we've taken your advice. We've joined Patreon. If you don't know, Patreon's a site that lets you all watching make recurring contributions directly to us to help us make the things that you're watching. The circle of life, if you will. And any contribution can actually make a big difference. The way the math works out, if even just half of you were to send us the equivalent of a $1 cup of coffee each month, it would totally add up. You are also welcome to donate more, whatever you're comfortable with, but the point is, as more of you donate, we'd actually start to scale this channel up more and more, and our current team could start working full time, we'd hire more editors, we'd launch new shows, and eventually we'd start releasing videos every single day. For instance, I've got so many Game of Thrones theory and historical connections videos that are sitting in my head right now that I'm desperate to make. So if you've got a second now or after the video's done, head on over to patreon.com slash new rockstars and check out all the stuff we have planned to do, like getting our videos translated into more languages, which is something a lot of you have been asking for. Uh, and also check out the perks that you get when you sign up to be one of our supporters. Things like exclusive theory and Q&A articles that are gonna be released only on Patreon or early access to our videos or video chatting with us about all things nerdy. Anyway, thank you in advance for anything you're able to contribute to help us make more of these videos. You guys are great, let's move on. Oh, and we're moving on right into theory time. We're still talking about Rick and Stark, and while it's sad that he's gone, you can find some comfort in one thing. John says, I'm gonna bury my brother in the crypt. I think that's really important. Skip to this time if you don't wanna know why, but Rickon always loved the crypts. He felt very safe there. It's where he was hiding in that scene earlier. So it is nice that he gets to spend eternity there. However, the fact that it sounds like John is gonna be the one to take him down in there, well, that's interesting because you know who else is laid to rest down there? Lyanna Stark, Ned's sister, and if the theory is true, John's real mother. But why is that a big deal? Because John has dreamt of this moment in the crypts multiple times. In the books, he very, vividly describes this dream to his buddy Sam. He says he finds himself wandering the crypts. He knows he has to go in, but he doesn't know why. The old kings of winter are down there, but it's not them he's afraid of. In other descriptions, he hears whispers that he's not a Stark. So if he's not afraid of the old kings of winter, then what is he afraid of? Could it be his mother, Lyanna? Will John examining her tomb lead him to discovering the truth about his own parentage and that he isn't a Stark, he's a Targaryen? Or maybe even worse, would he learn not only who his parents are, but maybe something terrible about them. We all know that his mother could be Lyanna Stark and his father could be Rhaegar Targaryen, but what if he learned something like Lyanna didn't want him to survive? But we know Lyanna's last words were, promise me Ned. And I would bet money, by the way, that we will see more of the Tower of Joy next episode, probably through Bran. And I expect to hear that line. But what if that promise was not a good one? Like maybe it's not a promise to care for the baby, but a promise to kill the baby because he's an heir to the Targaryen throne. And maybe Lyanna hated Rhaegar. I know that sounds like a lot of maybes, but it would explain not only why Jon would be scared of this dream revelation, which would be so dark, by the way, and we know George R. R. Martin likes dark, but also it would explain why when Ned was having nightmares way back when, he dreams of blood and broken promises. Why would they be broken promises if all she wanted was him to take care of Jon or even hide his identity? He did those things, but if she asked him to kill the baby, well, then that definitely would be a broken promise. Also though, maybe it could be something way less dark, like maybe he finds just evidence of Rhaegar and Lyanna having been married or something, and he's not such a bastard. His parents were actually married to each other. Targaryens did allow for polygamous marriage. Or as is always the case with theory time, maybe it's nothing. But I'll be damned if we get through the next episode and we don't at least have the strongest teasing hint ever that Rhaegar and Lyanna are John's parents. Okay, 
back to normal mode. And we're on to the battle. And yes, this was the most amazing battle the show has had yet. The director that I keep referencing, his name is Miguel Sapochnik, and he also directed Hard Home last year, which was the second most amazing battle now that the show's ever had. This guy's a genius. And actually, I feel like so much has already been said about this battle. And I'm gonna try to stick to mostly stuff that I haven't seen around a lot. Uh, let's dive in. But first, let's clarify the Stark strategy that they were supposed to use, in case you missed it. The Starks were supposed to hold back and just wait the Bolton army out. It's crucial that we let them charge at us. When the Bolton army has had enough waiting and charges, they won't be able to spread out and come around the sides of the force because the Stark men dug trenches on the sides of the battlefield, so it'll create a lane that they have to stay inside of. Once the Boltons drive up the center, the center of the Stark force would retreat backward, causing the Boltons to chase them, but letting the Stark forces surround them on the two other sides and making the Boltons have to fight the battle on three fronts at the same time. It's actually a pretty brilliant strategy, and now here's the missable part of it. It's exactly what Ramsay ends up doing to the Starks. Ramsay draws them out first, not once, but twice, and then he actually one-ups their plan by surrounding them not just on three sides, but by adding that wall of the dead and having Lord Umber drive up the rear, they actually surround them on four sides. Honestly, it's pretty genius. And the historical precedence for these strategies is really well known, but I gotta take off. I'm going to VidCon right now, so Eric is gonna tag in and help break down the rest of the episode. Feel free to tweet at me or hit me up on Facebook for any uh, questions you have directly for me. Uh, yes, I think next week's episode is going to be crazy, especially considering how much stuff they have to wrap up. But I gotta go, my ride is here, so I'll see you next time, bye. Hey guys, Eric taking over now to talk about the real nerdy stuff, history. Huzzah! So like Philip said, Miguel Sapochnik looked to a bunch of famous historical battles to inspire the war strategy that we saw in Battle of the Bastards. So let's get started. Okay, so first is the Battle of Agincourt between England and France in 1415 during the Hundred Years' War. So in that battle, the outnumbered English forces planned to use the same let them charge at us tactic that Davos and John wanted to use. Except, just like John, the English were forced to charge first. But one of the big reasons Agincourt is famous is it was one of the first times the longbow was used so predominantly. Now, the long Longbow is a lot taller than other types of bows. It lets archers fire from long ranges. And just like in Agincourt, a lot of the deaths we see in the Battle of the Bastards are from arrows. And pretty much all of these arrows are coming from Ramsay's side. Davos backs down because he doesn't want to kill his own men. I was just kill our own men, stand down. But Ramsay doesn't care. He just orders all of his men. Yeah! Now, why is this important? Two reasons. One, Ramsay's using another strategy borrowed from Battles of History, and it's a pretty dark one, using mounds of corpses to box in the enemy. Now, in the American in Civil War and several other high casualty wars, uh, several first-hand accounts described bodies piling up so high that they were becoming literal obstructions on the battlefield. But two, this brings up that recurring theme of loyalty that Philip was talking about earlier. Using arrows like this was also a tactic used by Ramsay's father, Roose Bolton, during the Battle of the Green Fork. That's the one where Tyrion got knocked out in the show, but in the book, Tyrion notices that arrows are raining down into the melee, killing men on both sides, and he's shocked that Roose would even order that. Roose's men are not that that important to him. They're like pawns or beasts for the slaughter. It's one-sided loyalty coming from Roos. Also, while I'm on this point, remember Ramsay was conceived when Roos raped a woman under the hanging body of her husband. So really, it was Roos Bolton who instilled this whole old school feudal ideology into the Bolton family. This idea of one-sided loyalty. And then that idea is the same thing that inspired Ramsay to kill Roos, just like it will end up doing Ramsay in as well. But getting back to the historical background of this battle scene, this shot of John getting trampled by his own men in the mud, nearly suffocating, that's actually something that happened to the soldiers in the Battle of Agincourt. Men were literally stampeded and buried alive underneath corpses, drowning as mud seeped into their helmets. So it if you felt claustrophobic during this scene, congrats. That's exactly how those soldiers felt, but in real life. We survived. They didn't. We're the lucky ones. We don't have to fight in wars. That's great. But anyway, I'll come back to this shot. There's another famous battle that inspired the direction of the Battle of the Bastards, the Battle of Canae. So when we see the Bolton soldiers encircling John's army with these shields, that was based on the same tactic used in the Battle of Canae that was fought between the Romans and the Carthaginians in 216 BC. The Carthaginians, led by Hannibal, encircled the Romans with their shields and killed them off. Now, the show actually designed the shield wall using the same structure uh, by the soldiers who had shields back in the Roman times. It's several layers deep with the front line just holding the shields and the line behind it poking these pikes through. Also, the chanting that you hear 
tactic from the soldiers back in those days. It worked both as a form of intimidation and as a way to synchronize their movements since they couldn't really see each other. Also, I should probably point out that seeing shields used in battle is actually a really rare thing for Game of Thrones. They pretty much never use shields. That's probably because they're heavy props and they obstruct the camera's view of the actors. But here, shields are a game changer in this battle, just like they were in most battles of history. Also, it's cool to see that they made a miniature version of a shield for the actor playing 1-1. One -one. So aside from the history that inspired the strategy of this battle, let's talk about some of the cinematic influences. So this type of battle is called a pitch field battle. And the director, Miguel Sapochnik, watched as many famous movie pitch field battles that he could find. So Philip mentioned this earlier, but one of the major film influences on this battle scene was the movie Ron by Japanese film director Akira Kurosawa. Now, Ron is a movie that shows these famous aerial shot battle scenes with horses and men just slamming against each other over and over again until we don't feel anything anymore. Kurosawa's goal was to condemn the horror of war and to show a time without loyalty or fealty. He shot things from an overhead perspective toward the ground, rarely showing us the sky because he wanted to show us things from the God's perspective as we saw men slaughter each other. Sapochnik wanted to evoke that same condemnation of war, intentionally showing us violent stabs and hits without focusing on the victim. He also emphasizes the role of randomness and luck in battle. Arrows are landing all around John and killing people around him, but notice none of them actually hit him. It's a miracle. And in several shots, threats get taken out before John even sees them. Now, you could call this luck or plot armor or even Melisandre's protection cells, but it's clearly by design. But Sapochnik intentionally deviates from Kurosawa in a few key ways. The first is that he shifts from these aerial shots into John's perspective. He wants us to empathize with John's sense of panic. Check out this one minute tracking shot where the camera never cuts as John fights through the melee like he's trapped in the middle of traffic. This shot conveys the horror of war, but from John's eyes in particular. I feel like it's inspired by that famous long take from Children of Men where the chaos unfolds around a character while the camera never cuts away. These kind of shots pull you into the action like you're in the middle of hell with the character. Quick missable moment I want to point out here. When John spins around to swing at this rider about to slash at him, check out how his Valerian steel sword totally shatters this other guy's sword. You can see the chunks of it flying away. His sword doesn't break up all the swords that it comes into contact with during this battle, but this guy on horseback is coming up at a greater speed. Either way, John's sword is super effective. It's a cool detail that they worked in there. Like Kurosawa, Sapochnik uses a long lens. Now, a long lens compresses objects in the foreground with objects in the background. Kurosawa used it for a few reasons. He liked how it flattened an image, similar to the way a Japanese art is two-dimensional. And it also saved him a lot of money because he wouldn't have to show a lot of detail in the background that way. Sapochnik also uses a long lens, but he finds a new effective way to use it. Check out this shot in particular of John as he faces off against a charging Bolton cavalry. The long lens makes the horses look a lot closer than they are in real life. It feels claustrophobic, like they're closing in on them. That way the director can make the horses look like they're running into each other or closing in on each other rather than actually slamming the animals into each other and, and hurting them, uh, which Kurosawa unfortunately did because it was the 50s and the standards for animal safety on film sets didn't really exist. And I talked about this earlier, but that claustrophobia and that empathy really comes across in these shots of John being trampled. We physically cannot breathe. We feel that pressure too. And when John finally emerges and gasps for air, then we can finally inhale. There's a similar shot in Kill Bill Volume 2, if you saw that movie, where the bride has to crawl out of a grave and we can't breathe until she does. Uh, fun fact, Tarantino was also influenced by Kurosawa when he was making those movies. Now that actually brings up a ton of other cinematic references that this battle sequence makes, so I'm gonna try to go through all the ones that I spotted. First off, uh, Braveheart is a clear influence on this scene. It was one of the first movies to show a graphic pitch field battle from the ground perspective with close-ups of men clashing and really cutting into each other with lots of gore and bloodshed, not just lightly slashing swords and moving on. Similarly, this battle scene covers all the soldiers with mud and blood. No one is clean. There's also similar shots of arrows raining down on soldiers. Also, the sharpened bone that we see Tormund use to stab Umber is similar to the antler William Wallace uses. Also, I feel like I should point out that Jorah Mormont, even though he's long dead in the Game of Thrones universe, was another actor in Braveheart. And a lot of these shots seem inspired directly from the movie Lord of the Rings Return of the King. I like that slow motion shot of the horses galloping. Looks a lot like the ones from the famous Faramir charge montage. That's one where Pippin's singing. Uh -huh. Also, this shot of Jon facing off solo against the cavalry looks a lot like Aragorn at the Black Gate, which also has a similar aerial enclosing circle shot, like the one from this episode. Also, when they hear the horns of the Knights of the Vale, <laughs> That's similar to the horns of Rohan in the Battle of Pelennor Fields. <laughs> The way that the Knights of the Vale sweep across the Boltons like a wave, 
parallels the Army of the Dead in that battle. But before I move on, there's just a few more missable details that I want to point out. Like, notice how when John emerges from the sea of bodies, this shot mirrors that overhead shot of Daenerys surrounded by people in that Misa scene. Now, the season keeps showing us parallel shots of John and Daenerys, and all that is obviously intentional. And if Daenerys becomes increasingly villainous, like Philip was talking about earlier, it could mean a conflict is brewing between these two. Also, I thought it was interesting how Tormund took this big bite out of Umber's neck. That reminded me of the bite that Brienne took out of the Hound during their close quarters fight really think these two are just made for each other. And check out this shot of Sansa. The camera zooms right past Littlefinger because, in this moment at least, this isn't his victory, it's Sansa's. She averts her eyes away from Jon, and it looks like she's feeling guilty here because she showed more loyalty to Littlefinger than to her half-brother. And Jon is like, what the F, huh? Why, why didn't you tell me about these guys? Come on. Uh, and yeah, that is the big question we all have, right? Like, why didn't Sansa tell Jon about Littlefinger in the Knights of the Vale? I actually think the next episode is going to address this fully, but for now, I I have a few theories why Sansa didn't tell him. One, in the days leading up to the battle, Sansa could see how emotional and impulsive Jon was being, and she didn't want to hand over her ace in the hole to get mostly wiped out in the opening melee when Jon Leroy Jenkins to cross the battlefield. She wanted to hold off until they would be more effective later in the battle. But two, I think this could have been a tactic coming from Littlefinger. Remember, he made that deal with Cersei last season before the first battle of Winterfell between the Boltons and Stannis. That's Stannis and Roos battle. Let the enemies of the throne slaughter each other, and when they're done, seize Winterfell from whichever thief survives. And if you succeed? Name me Warden of the North. Hanging back to let both sides wipe each other out while he swoops in at the end to tip the scale, that was always Littlefinger's plan. And now he has by far the largest army in the North, maybe all of Westeros, and he's poised to become Warden of the North if he follows through on his deal with Cersei. And I'll know you're a man of your word when I see Sansa Stark's head on a spike. But whatever the reason she didn't tell him, in this shot you can see what Philip was talking about earlier, that Jon is not on equal ground with this deal. And he's being forced into an allegiance that he didn't really agree to. That's not true loyalty, and I think Littlefinger could end up being a big problem for Jon in the near future. So 1-1 one, one plows through the gates of Winterfell, and there's a lot of layers to this callback that I really like. On one level, it's a callback to when 1-1 one, one plowed through the gates of Castle Black back in episode 2 of this season. Doors clearly aren't a problem for this guy. But remember, 1-1 one, one was the last giant, and one of the other other last giants was the one that we saw who smashed through the other side of Castle Black. And it was interesting how in that season four scene, we really wanted to see that giant get taken down, but this time we feel the opposite. We're on the wildling side. And of course, one one giving his life at a door is a mirror image of Hodor's death. One giant held the door, this other giant brought it down, and we cried at both. Also, this one might be a stretch, but this reminds me of the scene in Season 4 with Sansa and Robin in the Eyrie, where Robin stomped and kicked over Sansa's snow model of Winterfell, just like a giant. Here we see another giant breaking into Winterfell the same way. So I don't know about you, but here's a question I had about Ramsay in this moment. Now, if he could shoot one one in the eye here, why doesn't he just shoot Jon? Like, he clearly didn't aim for Jon and miss and hit one one. That was an intentional move. Uh, so when you think about it, either way, Ramsay knows he's a dead man. But if he shoots Jon when he's not looking, one one or Tormund or one of the other wildlings is just going to pulverize him without thinking twice. But leaving Jon alive keeps the game going. He's able to bait him back in a single combat, which is what Jon initially proposed. You suggested one-on-one -on -one combat, didn't you? So pissing off Jon but not killing him still gives Ramsay a fighting chance. Also, I like this detail here. Notice how Jon uses the Mormont shield to block Ramsay's arrows. So even though he was only able to get 62 soldiers from House Mormont, their shield is saving his life several times over. So it's just pointing out how Jon needed every bit of help he could get to take back his home. So when Jon finally takes down Ramsay, he lets his emotion take over again. The director actually told Kit Harrington to play this like he was beating an animal with no regard for Ramsay at all, and Kit responded that he would make it look like he was kneading bread. The idea was that this should be an empty victory for Jon, a nosedive into darkness, so that it would set up him handing this over to Sansa to finish the job. Again, Sansa's pragmatism is outweighing Jon's impulsiveness and emotion. But if you look closely at this overhead shot, someone else is standing in this courtyard that none of the angles show. Show, Littlefinger. It's like the scene went out of his way not to give him his own shot. So as usual, Littlefinger stays the man behind the scenes, looming over everything, waiting for other people to do the heavy lifting so that he can pick up the pieces when the dust settles. So this shot of the Bolton banner dropping and being replaced with a Stark banner is such a satisfying victory moment. Kind of like seeing the American flag being raised at Iwo Jima, if you're American. Uh, 
you're from any other country, just to replace that with your country's flag. It'll be great to see the Bolton Flayed Man on Winterfell get replaced with the Stark Direwolf in the opening credits next episode, just like the gods intended it to be. So moving on to the final scene when Sansa confronts Ramsay. And even though this is clearly the end for him, he still acts like he's in control. Our time together is about to come. He invoked the famous historical Hannibal during the battle, but now he invokes another famous Hannibal from movies, creepily greeting us from behind bars. Hello, Sansa. So we're keeping the Ramsay horror tropes going with Silence of the Lambs, but Ramsay reminds me of another caged movie villain in the way he tells Sansa, I'm part of you now. It's like he's telling her that he turned her from the innocent caged bird into uh, an evil, ruthless person just like he is. Or in other words, Tonight you're gonna break your one rule. There's actually another Dark Knight connection in this scene that I'll get to in a second. So a lot of people are thinking that Ramsay saying, I'm part of you now, might mean he impregnated her. I guess it's possible. I mean, we did see Sansa sewing new clothes early this season, and she had a different appetite back in Castle Black, and I guess those heavy cloaks are hide her body shape. But I'm kind of leaning against it just because it seems like the show is ending this storyline with Ramsay's death, and considering it must have taken at least a few months for Jon and Sansa to crisscross the north to build up their troops, I feel like she would have started showing by now. Okay, so there's a couple things that I want to point out in the background here. First off, this black dog that emerges from the shadows. I feel like it could be a reference to the Grim, which is a black dog that's an omen for death, just like Ramsay's death is imminent. But check out how the editing matches up with Sansa's words when Ramsay's looking out the snowy window. Your name will disappear. All memory of you will disappear. Ramsay has been obsessed with names this episode and pretty much the entire time that we've known him. Becoming a Bolton was a huge deal for his character. Now tell me, what is your name? Ramsay Snow. From this day until your last day, you are Ramsay Bolton, son of Roose Bolton, Warden of the North. You honor me. And all episode, he was rubbing it in other people's faces. Bastard, bastard, bastard. But now, Sansa is taking that name back from him. He's back to who he was before, Ramsay Snow. And what is he looking at through the window? Snow. And that brings us to our closing images. For Ramsay, being stripped of his place in history transforms him from a lord who could command loyalty and fealty to a bastard with no real claim and no one loyal to him. Unlike the bastard who won this battle, Ramsay treated his men like beasts, sending them to be slaughtered by his own arrows and literally starving these dogs for seven days. Literally everyone who has served Ramsay has been a victim of his cruelty. Theon, Sansa, Roose Bolton, his own soldiers, every woman he's ever slept with. And they're all hungry to turn on him now. So so when he says, My hands will never harm me. They're loyal beasts. It brings up another line from the Joker. And then we'll see how loyal a hungry dog really is. Everyone in this episode is repaying cruelty by breaking loyalty. These dogs with Ramsay, a former slave like Grey Worm killing the masters, and this wife turning on her husband. Earlier this season, when Ramsay stuck his hounds on Fat Walda and the baby, the camera luckily didn't show us that violence. But this time, Sansa forces us to watch. She starts to turn away, but then she decides, no, nah, I need to see this. And so does the audience. The dog repays Ramsay's lack of loyalty with a bite to the jaw and neck. And as you hear him scream, you can almost make out the squeal of a pig. <laughs> that was actually an intentional move by the director and the sound designer. That's because the director learned that when the human windpipe is severed, it makes the same kind of wheeze sound. Uh, pretty graphic. Don't get any ideas, Kylo. <laughs> oh god. And I love this. Check this out. When Sansa walks away, she does it in the same exact camera frame that we saw John when his watch was ended back in episode 3, and how she left the faceless men last episode. All these closing images are exactly the same. That makes three Starks who are now brushing off the things that were holding them back, ready to reclaim the home that was always there. Okay, so a few lingering questions. One, do you think Sansa was being manipulative this season? Remember, back in episode 4, Sansa convinced John to march on Winterfell specifically specifically to save Rickon. A monster has taken our home and our brother. But in this episode, she pretty much assumes Rickon's going to die anyway. What should we do? How do we get Rickon back? We'll never get him back. So I'm wondering if this whole battle was just so Sansa could get her revenge on Ramsay. Not to say that she's wrong for wanting that or Ramsay doesn't deserve revenge, he totally does, but to sacrifice the lives of thousands of men just for your own selfish desire for revenge seems like it's a big deal for Sansa. Notice the smile on her face when she's walking away in the closing shot. She looks pretty satisfied with herself. And if this is really the case, uh, I mean, Sansa really has taken a dark turn and that Ramsay 
Ramsey really is a part of her now. Also, now that Ramsey Bolton is gone, who is the main villain of Westeros now? Now, obviously, the Night King is the supernatural big bad for the end game of Game of Thrones, but I'm wondering which human will step up as the most ruthless. Philip was talking about Daenerys before. Littlefinger is now the guy with the largest army in Westeros, maybe, and he has his thumb over three of the seven kingdoms. So this guy is really looking like the evil genius, and I'm curious to see what his next move is. And of course, if our theories about Cersei end up being true, she may go full circle from the evil queen that we hated in the first season, or the empathetic mother that we got to know in some of the later seasons, back to being the evil queen again. But we'll have to see what happens next episode. Also, this may just be me, but I'm curious, are we going to see a naval battle on this show? Uh, Daenerys is now headed west with her small fleet, composed of the ships that she got from the Masters, and the ones brought by Yara and Theon. But we know that Euron is building his thousand ships and heading east to meet her. So this would set up an interesting conflict. We know the Dothraki don't sail well, and the Ironborn boarding parties seem like they'd be more useful in a battle at sea, as opposed to dragons who just burn everything in sight. And if Philip's idea of Daenerys and Yara riding the two dragons ends up happening, who do you think will be riding that third dragon? Let me know what you think, and again, if you like what we do here at New Rockstars and you want to contribute, make sure to check out our Patreon page. Seriously, we're a tiny operation here. It's just Philip and me and Ted and Kylo, and if you help us out, I promise you'll really start to see a difference in how fast and frequent we can get these videos out. Also, check out our past breakdowns of the other Game of Thrones episodes this season, and look out for a breakdown on the season finale next week. And uh, make sure to subscribe to New Rockstars, and like this video, share it around. That's another way you can help grow this channel. You can follow us on Twitter, at New Rockstars, or hit up Philip on Twitter, at Fimo, or me, at EA Voss. You can also get in touch with Philip on Facebook, at facebook.com slash Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next week. Bye.